Thank you very much. Um, so this is a, uh, a talk that um, is part of, uh, I think, what the World Federation of Neurology is about. And I want to share with you where I think we're going and how I think we may be able to proceed uh, successfully. This is um, the overview. I want to talk a little bit about the causes of inequities of access to neurological care, um, how we can identify and quantify them, and how we may have an approach to mitigate them. And if you think about it, the World Federation of Neurology's uh, goal and that of the WHO is uh, very similar, and you'll see this uh, as I proceed. So briefly touching on uh, the causes of inequities, there's three of the main ones, I'm not going to go into them all, but in the increasing socioeconomic divide between the rich and poor countries, the burgeoning global burden of neurological disease and that of the overall population, and the cost of modifying medications. So just to uh, look at the increasing divide between uh, those countries which are well off and those which have limited resources. Uh, some of you may have seen this slide before. Um, the, uh, the top 10 on your left and the lower 10 on your right. And you can see that there's well over a hundred fold difference between those average per capita uh, levels of income. A, a huge difference. And if you look at uh, what's happened over time between 2005 to 2017, this is the top uh, 10 um, in 2005 on the left. The average uh, income per person was 48,000 uh, US dollars. In 17, 70,000 US dollars. And those, four of those 11 increased by 30% over that time. The overall average increase was 45%. If you look at the lowest 10, or 11 on this slide, um, you can see that it was 269 was the mean average income per year per person. Um, and then it rose over the 12 years to 430. Some of those countries, the average income rose by as much as 60%. So you think that's not bad. But if you look uh, carefully between the lowest and upper uh, ranked countries um, over that time, um, it's still a 160-fold difference. So there's been no change, really, in that difference between the highest uh, income countries and the lowest income countries. I want to now touch on the uh, global burden of neurological disease. This, there was a summit held recently in Auckland uh, where the results of the 2016 um, study on the global burden of disease uh, were presented. And you can see here that if you look at the income versus the disease uh, burden, here's where the disease burden is heaviest in Africa and Southeast Asia, and here's where income is lowest in those two places. So you can see that's going to be quite a, a difficult problem. More importantly, if just to give you some idea of um, the, uh, the burden of disease, dailies are a, a measure, by, a standardised measure by which these are estimated in each country, and most of those came from South Asia and from Sub-Saharan Africa. That's where the burden is greatest. Since stroke was included in the global burden of neurological disease, it's now the... Um, the leading cause of disability and the second leading cause of death, that is neurological diseases are, and of those, stroke is 40%, migraine 16%, Alzheimer's and other dementias 10%, and meningitis 8%. This is a heat map uh, showing the same data in a different, uh, a different fashion. Um, you can see the non-communicable diseases are, are grouped here and run across and sub-Saharan Africa is here. So this, this area here, right through from Asia, is where these diseases are most heavily centred. Another way of looking at this is the, uh, these um, graphs here. I've shown a stroke here in women. It's risen enormously. And more so in men. 
Alzheimer's disease is now rising in women, less so in men, uh, and migraine is prominent throughout. That's the green here, but particularly starting in a, at a younger age. And this summarizes it all, um, if you like, uh, between 2016 versus 1990. And you can see this very large increase in the numbers of people afflicted uh, and disabled or who have died prematurely. So to summarize the, uh, the current study, it, these diseases are increasing in all countries. They are um, increasing mainly due to increases in the population. The age standardized rates are the same, uh, but the numbers are increasing uh, exponentially. And the lack of established modifiable risks for most of the neurological burden means an increasing unmet need for, the new, for new prevention and treatment strategies. Just to take a look at dementia for, uh, for a second, this is it highlighted here in blue, again showing the age range and the numbers. And you can see that this is later in life where it's uh, occurring mainly. But the new data enables us now to not only look at the age standardized rates, but the numbers increasing so that we can now predict and project what's going to happen in the future. Here's a slide loaned to me by Professor Shakir um, showing that um, the projected increases in dementia by 2015 in the world will be up to 131 million people living with it. And half of that will be in the Asian region. Alzheimer's Disease International um, have expressed their frustration at the lack of speed, a lack of uh, progress in combating dementia. Their, their goal was to have 75% of the World Health Organization's 194 member states to have developed updated national policies, strategies, plans, or a framework for dementia by 25. As it stands, there are only 27 who have a national plan, whilst 28 say that they are developing them. So well short of their their goal, and that's a problem for all of us, uh, and inertia, I think, is the main problem. So to turn now to high costs of medication as a cause for inequities of access, this is not just a problem of uh, less well-resourced countries, but also some uh, of the more highly resourced countries have this problem. Um, and I think it's fair to say that it's uh, likely to be driven by first world countries. So here's the cost of developing a drug over the, uh, a new drug from scratch, from start, um, up here to uh, 1.5 million, uh, sorry, billion dollars for a new drug in 2010. And it's increased even further now. It was at 2.6 billion in 2014. And mo most recently, up to 2.9 billion per new drug. So you can see there's a, there's a great barrier to getting new medications onto the, uh, onto the market. Nevertheless, these, these uh, figures here are very high, but they do indicate that research is continuing and that there is hope for, uh, for people all over the world, even with rare diseases, that there will be some improvement. And certainly in rheumatoid arthritis and in multiple sclerosis, biological uh, preparations have proved enormously helpful, um, particularly in rheumatoid, and we're seeing the same trend in multiple sclerosis. The problem is, in the US, the price of drugs which have been brought onto the market continues to rise with time. So this is a real problem for us in the rest of the world. If it happens in the States, it's tending to happen around the world. Now, how does it occur? Well, I'll show you. Here's the uh, treatment for um, rheumatoid arthritis with monoclonal antibodies, these three. When they were introduced, uh, 14,000. The following year, that went up to 15,000. Same for uh, adalimumab, 16, 17,000 uh, a year, up to 19,000 uh, as it followed on. Here's some MS drugs, another example. Um, this is uh, the costs in 2015 for these common 
medications. Most of you will be familiar with them, but they've all stayed very high. They're all between 60 and um, $64,000 per year. They haven't come down at all. And the main reason for that is because they are in an inflexible market. And it's in the pharmaceutical company's interest to keep it inflexible so they can maintain the, the cost of drugs and their profit uh, in order to, they say, develop new drugs. Here's a, a graph again showing the TNF inhib uh, inhibitors for rheumatoid and first generation uh, MSDMTs. This is the treatment for uh, rheumatoid rising as we get to 2013, and look at what's happening to these old medications for multiple sclerosis. The price is going through the roof. Again, showing this exponential rise in the cost of many of these drugs, which in some parts of the world are no longer being used, but because of the system in the States, they are still being used uh, as major treatments. This is the... Uh, what happens in the Australian market with a flexible market. This is, these are these first generation drugs here from 2009. They shrink by the time you get to 2018. The, the, the use and these newer drugs are expanding. So the cost in Australia for these drugs has fallen dramatically and the use has also fallen. So they need to have a new market system in the, in the uh, US. So one of the ways to summarise how we may be able to do that is to improve competition, uh, to have a centralised reimbursement system, uh, have more government efforts to reduce drug prices and to have some physician and patient-led solutions. They've, they've listed a whole host of uh, reasons how they, uh, why it's high and what they might do, and I've just shown you one or two here, but one, another one is that in generic terms, if for generic preparations, there's something like 500 drugs available in the US without a competitor. So you can't have competition to drive the price down unless you have a competitor, and if you have no competitor, the price stays high. I'll just run through these things here. So this is what uh, an article uh, was lamenting, that uh, Congress should go back to what it was trying to do before and do it again and do it better to uh, improve competition and therefore make medications more accessible. Drug regulatory authorities are also part of the problem and I won't go into this in uh, much detail but there are instances when they have come in and established rules and regulations on the use of medications which were not shown by evidence-based studies in the original uh, pivotal trials. So they too have contributed to some extent to the rigidity of the system. It's happened in Europe and it's happened in the US. So how might we identify and quantify this? Well, the World Health Organization uh, earlier this year and uh, has this uh, topic listed again for early next year, uh, is looking at inequality of access as well. We've partnered with the World Health Organization in the ATLAS uh, uh, preparations around the world, looking at what facilities and what resources are available. Um, the problem, to some extent, is the, is the accuracy of the data. But nevertheless, it shows the same thing, that there is a high level of inequality and inequity of access to medications and to resources. The EAN, uh, the European Academy of Neurology has uh, surveyed its members on um, national uh, neurological resources. The AAN, the American Academy, plans to develop a d disparity file uh, within the states. Uh, and the WFN is preparing a needs registry. This is uh, a somewhat daunting slide showing uh, North America and Europe, population just over a billion, whereas the rest of the world, which is where the WFN is focusing, six and a half billion. So you can see there's a, a very big uh, effort required here. How might we do this, develop this needs registry? Well, the WFN is fortunate to have 122 member societies, six regional organisations, including the AAN and EAN, but also the African Academy, the Asian and Oceanian Association, Pan-American uh, Federation of Neurological 
um, societies and uh, the Pan-Arab Union of uh, Neurological Societies. And it's planned to have some pilot studies on this needs registry in these three areas in the not too distant future. We're also very fortunate that preparations had begun uh, by my predecessors, uh, Professor Haczynski, followed by uh, Professor Shakir and also uh, Werner Hacker, to develop uh, the, the uh, forerunner of the Global Neurological Alliance. That is, the World Brain Alliance included all the other major neurological uh, societies which weren't, sorry, major uh, neurological societies, but not specifically neurologies, like the neurosurgeons, like the psychiatrists, like the Child Neurological Association, EBRO, here. And then this uh, next one is uh, the, was the specialty um, neurological uh, uh, alliance. But these include all of these organizations here, the World Stroke Organization, Alzheimer's International, International League Against Epilepsy, Headache Society, Parkinson's Disease, Movement Disorders, Multiple Sclerosis, all here. So it covers all the areas of neurological disease which we are directly involved with. And then within the WFN, there are a number of smaller groups, Huntington's Imaging, Migrant Neurology, which we'll hear more about uh, at this meeting, ALS and Motor Neuron Disease, uh, and so on. So this grouping provides a very, very powerful uh, tool for advocacy to see if we can get change uh, regionally, nationally, and globally. So the approach is going to be based on partnerships. I don't think we can do anything at all to tackle six and a half, the problem in six and a half billion people without partnerships. So these are the the areas which we need to work on in disease prevention and limiting disability. So if we have cures and ways of modifying risk, then we will reduce the burden. And uh, I just put this slide here on the um, International Progressive MS Alliance, uh, where they're looking at trying to develop treatments for progressive MS, which as most of you will know, is an area of uh, high unmet need. Um, and ground is being made. Poliomyelitis, stroke, neurodegenerative diseases are also key areas. Universal access to a minimum of um, disease modifying medications, the so-called Essentials Medicine List, is an initiative by the World Health Organization. Um, so every country that is in difficulty um, has a means to leverage with their government uh, what um, the World Health Organization considers to be a minimum list of medications. For instance, in uh, multiple sclerosis, an area which I'm involved in, uh, MS International is preparing an application to uh, recommend to the uh, World Health Organization that these three drugs, glutirima acetate, fingolimod, and ocrelizumab, would be their essential medicines for multiple sclerosis and should be uh, helped to be made available worldwide. Advocacy campaigns for those two initiatives which I've just mentioned, but also on brain health awareness. This is a, an area which I think, uh, through no fault of our own, but we have uh, not worked hard enough in this area to try and increase the awareness of the World Health Organization and national and regional governments, large uh, NGOs, on the importance of brain health. So we need to use things like the Global Neurological Alliance, just within the WFN's uh, remit. We need to use the World Brain uh, Day program to expand that uh, in order to leverage these, uh, these effects. And then finally, in the education and resources, the World Federation of Neurology has uh, neurological training centers, which have been uh, moved along uh, considerably by Professor Shakir. There are two in Anglophone uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and two in Francophone and possibly a third coming and one in Mexico at the moment. And this is to increase the number of neurologists um, in order to try and improve access to neurological care. So uh, I just want to close now by saying this is an ambitious uh, uh, project that we're uh, engaged in and I don't think it's going to be completed in any short 
uh, time, but it is something which we have to go, uh, have to develop, that we have to work with, and we have to encourage partnerships in order to tackle it. It's not going to go away unless everybody starts to act in concert. Um, and I just wanted to highlight uh, the upcoming World Congress of Neurology in this region um, next year in Dubai, where this will also be a topic. Thank you.